Welcome everybody. It's lovely to see you all here. And thanks for everyone who's joined us. Um, welcome to all the speakers and to the participants. I'm Andrew Dorman. I'm the editor of International Affairs. And um, we have a great group of panelists here, all part of a special edition of International Affairs that has been put together for us. I should say from the start, this session is on the record and it's been recorded. So um, if you don't want your thoughts and your comments to be re recorded, don't say anything. Um, but welcome all, it's great to see you all. Um, on the record, this is a really important subject we're looking at. It's entitled um, Colonial Constructions of the Middle East and uh, South Asia. And what we've seen in, in the past, we've seen both research and policy makers in international relations can be influenced, whether intentionally or unintentionally, by racialized and colonial ideas. And our January edition that celebrates the 100th anniversary of international affairs, explores this very issue. In this webinar, what we're going to be doing is the contributors to the issue will be um, discussing how racialized and colonial ideas have impacted communities in the Middle East and South Asia, including women in the Afghan peace process. They will also examine Western policies towards the regions, including um, during the Arab Spring up uprisings and in the Israeli-Palestinian con uh, conflict. However, race and colonialism have not only impacted lives and policy decisions but also the very foundations of what we understand as a border of a nation, of regions. Now, it's interesting that the world we're focusing on the Middle East and South Asia, we're all also conscious of all of the events that are going on with uh, in the Ukraine at the moment. So let me start by introducing, we have five great speakers. Um, kicking us off will be uh, Athea Maria, uh, Rebus, who's a senior lecturer in global development studies at SOAS. Our second speaker and one of the guest editors of our special edition will then follow Jasmine Ghani, who's a senior lecturer in the School of International Relations at the University of St. Andrews, and is also co-director of the Center for Syrian Studies. Thirdly, we will have Sandeep San, associate professor in development studies at Roskilde University in Denmark. Uh, fourth will be Make sure I get this right. Um, Niv Manchanda, uh, senior lecturer in international politics at Queen Mary. And lastly, Shari uh, Plonsky, who is a senior lecturer in international politics at Queen Mary as well. I've asked each of the speakers, I've given them each five or six minutes. So that will take up about 25 to 30 minutes and then leaves us about half an hour for questions and answers. You can either hang on for questions and answers or you can start to put them into the Q&A box and um, I, I will moderate and put those questions out. Looking forward to a really exciting interactive session. So with no further ado, I will hand over to our first speaker. That's um, Athea, the floor is yours, so they say. Uh, thank you. So first, I wanted to thank um, Isabel and Andrew for inviting me to speak today and all of the hard work they've put into making this event happen. And of course, I want to extend a huge thank you to Jenna uh, Marshall and Jasmine Ghani for their incredible work as editors of the special issue. It was really a joy to be part of that process. So I've, um, as Andrew said, I've been asked to speak about how racialized and colonial ideas have impacted particularly Afghan women in the peace process and uh, women kind of fighting for peace. Uh, so I'm going to take a few minutes and uh, give you some of my thoughts on that. So in the article um, in the special issue, my co-author Miriam Safi and I really focus on looking at the gendered discourse and practice around the Afghan peace and reintegration project, which took place from 2010 to 2014. And the paper brings together the findings from three different projects that we did independently across a number of provinces in Afghanistan. And what we found was the mechanisms of intervention, patriarchy, and global hierarchies of knowledge production were working in tandem to marginalize Afghan women and invisibilize their voices and experiences while at the same time, curiously, kind of upholding them as agents of peace and symbols of the nation. And the paper tries to then challenge this hyper um, visualization and silencing of Afghan women by both um, forces inside of Afghanistan and international actors. And then we kind of try and pick this apart and move beyond representation and look specifically at the participants' intersectional realities, their articulations of peace and differentiated obstacles in their involvement in the peace process. So 
Afghanistan it itself is in many ways an archetype of uh, the post-colonial dream, right? Um, as part of the imperial project, you know, when encountering the natives, Europeans had to kind of categorize people in a way that would justify their actions. And the natives as such were then kind of deemed as primitive um, or backwards. And these ideas were necessary. They were a necessary story for European colonial expansion because the violence that accompanied colonialism could not just um, be justified solely because of the economic or political benefit of colonialism for Europe alone. They needed a moral argument. And therefore, through this moral argument, it became the white man's burden to conquer, conquer and colonize the rest of the world. Right? So it wasn't just for the good of Europe, but for the, also the benefit of those primitive people in, and backwards people in the colonies. And these tropes, which reproduce ideas of white saviorhood and supremacy, have become central to um, intervention and peacekeeping, international humanitarian and development work. So in the context of Afghanistan, particularly the depictions of Afghan women as brutalized became a necessary symbol in many ways for occupation and intervention. So through the various phases of war and conflict and you know, stunted attempts at peace in Afghanistan, the symbol of the Afghan woman has loomed large in international policy discussions and also in academic scholarship and not just mainstream academic scholarship, but critical academic scholarship as well. And stereotypes such as the permanently subordinated Afghan woman kind of walking through the dusty hills in a you know oppressive kind of blue burqa or the strong vocal woman speaking out for Afghan rights with just you know her headscarf slightly pulled back are all too common right so the colonial renaissance of the use of Afghan women's subordination as a constant trope for the rationale of the post 9-11 intervention has been widely interrogated but it's still really really persistent and common representations such as the victim, the modern politician, the peace warrior have been used to justify violence, occupation, intervention, and calls for peace. And it's upon these types of narratives that the image of the white savior has been maintained. So ironically, while uh, many public statements of support by international actors have highlighted uh, the need for cultural sensitivity local, and local ownership as important factors in supporting Afghan women's organizations and Afghan women in their struggles for peace, these spaces are also generally characterized by um, a large uh, a caution against making sweeping generalizations about Afghan women. Um, and also an uneven attention being given to the possibility that there might be dissenting views about Afghan values um, or Afghan women's positionalities amongst the women themselves, right? So we don't want to actually engage with them because we don't want to make cultural mistakes, which is a very paternalistic argument. And then there's no kind of um, discussion around the diversity or intersectionality amongst the women themselves or space for that engagement with them or on these issues. So even on occasions where the kind of latter possibilities explored, insufficient work has been done to support Afghan and women in developing a gendered language that might indeed reflect their own challenges, experiences, and desires. So despite the calls for inclusive peace, the discourse and practice on women's participation really offered little in consideration of the hopes and concerns of Afghan women themselves in the peace process that, uh, or the, in the reintegration process that took place between 2010 and 2014. And moving forward from 2014, some things did change. So Afghan women's organizing has been able to carve out a more, or was able to carve out a more substantial voice in the different processes. But ultimately these essentialized gender tropes and practices that supported them persisted, right? Which meant that we were constantly failing to recognize the political and social complexity of their lives and diminish their intellectual contributions, or even recognize that they were able to make intellectual contributions to discussions about peace within their own societies, which is amazing, right? Instead, we're constantly flattening out the subjectivities of these women, and therefore that allows this perpetual victimization of Afghan women, which then justifies further occupation, intervention, and silencing. It also invisibilized a, a variety of patriarchal structures within Afghan society, so within Afghan government, within the family, within the home, and the diversity of approaches amongst uh, those engaging in those kind of uh, patriarchal kind of structures and norms, or trying to push those patriarchal norms. The current situation now we find ourselves in, um, you know, the, the country is kind of mired in a new wave of uncertainty. Um, and among the numerous concerns for its future, again, the impact on the role of women in social and political life looms large, right? However, the short-term amnesia of the international community, which is so characteristic of past engagements in Afghanistan, seems to be replaying itself. And the gendered tropes 
have that have again framed the, the news headlines, the broadcast, social media, and also international appeals for funding, right? Like the recent UN appeal for um, over $4 billion, right? So almost immediately after the Taliban surge of, Afga of Kabul, the victimized Afghan woman, now not just behind the burqa, but also in other arenas of, of public life, right, began to appear. Those same centralized tropes that were put forward after 9-11 and between 2010 and 2014 are again being broadcast. The short-term amnesia that facilitates this is also a colonial indulgence, right? So the tendency to cause damage and then engage in denial has always been part of the colonial toolbox. And this is very much where we find ourselves now with international engagements in Afghanistan. So ultimately, when we talk about the possibilities of engagement with the Taliban or with Afghanistan, and in conversations that focus on using, the conversations tend to focus on using women's rights as a benchmark, we have to be careful to let those conversations be led by Afghan women, right? And to create space, not just for a political economy analysis that centers Global North concerns, but an intersectional analysis of the obstacles that those women face, the agencies that the agency that they hold in the different spaces that they occupy and the new realities of their life. I think I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. That's a great introduction. I'll now hand over to Jasmine. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you to Izzy for the work that's gone into this um, and to everyone for being here. And thanks also to Althea for our presentation, because I think actually some of the points you made help to lay out some of the foundations of what I'm going to be talking about in my own presentation. And so my article in International Affairs is um, a product of reading through hundreds of media and academic um, articles and policy or think tank papers. And um, based on now a decade of observing and following the reactions to the Arab uprisings in 2011. And the num number of the claims that I make in the article, um, it's based on a reflection of the trajectory of events and policies in these past 10 years, which has really cemented and strengthened some of the claims and ideas I had um, back in 20 2012 and 2013. So in the article, I make the following key points. Firstly, knowledge production and discourse does shape policy, and it does translate into practice. So for those of us who speak about, and write about a region or a particular topic, we carry a responsibility because it has an impact on politics and on people's lives. Secondly, in relation to the Middle East specifically, the knowledge and the discourse produced is never in a historical or ideological vacuum. So instead of assuming empirical objectivity, any analyst or commentator needs to consciously preface any thoughts, any comments on the Middle East, or actually on Muslims more broadly, who tend to be synonymized with the Middle East, there needs to be a prefacing um, of any comments with a consciousness of a deeply orientalist racist history of representation of the Middle East and Muslims that exist in the West. And thirdly, um, an argument that I'm making here is um, that this transition of what Edward Said calls latent Orientalism into manifest Orientalism, so that's a shift from discourse and ideas into policy um, and reality, um, that this transition is, is not inevitable. It's not a natural process that can never be altered, but actually that transition um, into manifest Orientalism and Orientalist policies can be disrupted through incorporating more diversity in who we consult and platform and listen to um, across ideological, gendered, age spectrums, and especially by bringing into our debates and discussions people from the region, those who are often from minority backgrounds who might be directly affected. So I just want to briefly outline what that history of Orientalism is before moving on to address the way in which the discourse on the Arab uprising specifically developed and reflected that history of Orientalism. So firstly, the West's approach to the Middle East has been shaped historically by civilizational beliefs. Um, especially from the 18th and the 19th century. And by that, I mean that the West saw itself, still does see itself at the top of a hierarchy of races, with non-Western societies deemed to still be in their infancy 
and in varying stages of quote unquote underdevelopment. And the Middle East, or often it was seen as the Orient, was seen to be somewhere in the middle of that hierarchy, right? So low enough to be stigmatized as irrational, dogmatic and passive, but high enough and also geographically close enough to the West to be seen as a military and ideological threat. So a belief in the need to tutor backward Arabs and especially Muslim Arabs in the art of statecraft to bring order and civilization to the region meant that, um, for example, historically, we had the European mandate system after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Um, it also has led to a desire to mold the Middle East in the West's own image alongside a deep mistrust of agency, independent agency in the region. And that's never fully disappeared, even today. So I've seen it repeatedly manifested, um, for example, through Western support for military coups. Um, we've seen it through direct military intervention, um, Iraq in 2003 being the most prominent and obvious one, Afghanistan, if we sort of move further east um, to South Asia, Althea mentioned is another example, also debilitating sanctions. We've seen it in Gaza after 2006 or continued support for authoritarian allies. And that's particularly been reflected since the 2011 Arab uprisings. And so to finish off, to round off, um, I want to just highlight some key trends that we saw in the discourse about the Arab uprisings uh, in 2011 up until 2013. So we saw three camps. The first was um, a discourse from, which is very essentialist, um, which is quite a conservative view of the region and Muslims more broadly, which saw them as being, um, you could not trust their agency and very pessimistic predictions were made right from the start. But the second group is more nuanced. And that's where we see the liberal optimist camp, which initially celebrated the uprisings with a lot of hope and assumption that they would follow a Western liberal trajectory. Lots of comparisons made to um, uh, democratic uprisings in Eastern Europe, for example. But when it became apparent that the outcome would be messier, and especially when we saw so-called Islamist groups starting to fare well in post-Arab, post-uprising elections, the discourse amongst liberal optimists switched to a pessimistic narrative and switched their labels from, for example, the Arab Spring, which is quite optimistic, to labels such as the Arab Winter or the Islamist Winter. And then finally, the, the, the last camp that I touch upon in the article um, is leftist narratives, which typically are um, quite sympathetic to um, Middle East criticisms, for example, of Western intervention, but actually their accounts of Arab, the Arab uprisings eventually also shared this pessimism for the outcome of the uprisings, inadvertently falling back on these Orientalist stigmas and stereotypes in order to make their case against Western intervention. So a key thing that we need to remember here is that Orientalism is not just manifested in neoconservative interventionist politics, but it can also be reflected in more progressive left-leaning narratives against intervention. And I'll close just by connecting this to some of the narratives that we've seen with the since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, where a lot of the media coverage has talked about uh, sort of compared what's happening there with the Middle East, with Afghanistan to demonstrate how unique and exceptional the invasion of Ukraine is because it's, it doesn't reflect the typical instability and the backwardness that we might assume of these other distant parts of the world. And that's very reflective of the idea that agency and demands for change in the Middle East were not taken seriously enough um, because there's almost an acceptance and a satisfaction with the status quo um, in the Middle East was assumed to not be civilized enough to aspire to democracy. So thank you, and I'll, I'll end there. Thank you very much, Jasmine. And can I remind you, if you've got the, the audience, if you've got questions, please put them in the Q&A box, and we'll, we'll get to them after all the presenters have gone through. I'm next delighted to hang over to Sandeep. The floor is yours. Um, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Jasmine and Jenna, for putting this together. Um, <clears throat> well, what I've noticed you know, in this discussion, but also in, in terms of the volume in general, there's this sort of cascading imperial knowledge, right? So you have these <clears throat> history and legacy of colonialism, which then shapes scholarship, which then shapes practice. And, I'm, and what's also interesting is that that practice then 
position certain parts of the world, the Middle East, South Asia, Europe, in a particular way in the global order, which in turn, which in turn then you know informs um, the history or the historical trajectory of these places. I'm glad um, Jasmine mentioned um, Ukraine, and it's quite interesting in terms of the kinds of practice, in terms of uh, diplomacy uh, policies that we're we're implementing, and those practices are meant to uh, position Ukraine in a certain way in the global order, right? And, um, and you know, how, what they deserve uh, you know, as, as a country and as a society. So um, my um, article begins with practice, and I look at the um, EU's peace-building efforts, which peace-building as state-building efforts in, in Palestine. Of course, state-building has a particular history in Palestine and goes back to the Oslo Accords, which established the Palestinian Authority as uh, the precursor to the eventual Palestinian state. That was the official narrative, and the argument was that insurgent politics, politics, revolutionary violence, revolutionary politics would not lead to peace, and state building is what leads to peace. Um, you know, what we know empirically, um, and it's well documented, is that that didn't work. Right. Then that um, that precursor to the eventual state did not secure Palestinian status. It not, did not secure Palestinian liberation. Uh, <clears throat> it didn't end Israel settler colonialism or military occupation of Palestinian lands. Um, <clears throat> and over the last summer, uh, what we what was again with uh, what we were again witness to is the ways in which um, not least to the security cooperation between the Palestinian Authority. And, um, and, and the Israeli state, um, this sort of mechanism of state building, in fact, works to undermine the liberation movement, undermine the, the Palestinian cause for, for liberation. So the evidence is there that the state building doesn't work. It hasn't led to peace. And why is it that the EU um, invests so much in state building measures, whether it's funding the salaries of uh, the bureaucrats and the Palestinian Authority, funding the, 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 um, the, uh, the police, and so on and so forth. And for that, um, I went back to sort of um, colonial history, um, colonial, colonial wars and colonial counterinsurgency campaigns, where the roots of this um, um, sacrosanctity that is accorded to the state and the um, stigmatization of revolutionary violence is already there. Whether it is the counterinsurgency campaigns of, of, of in British India, whether it's the massacres conducted by the Dutch colonial administration in Indonesia, or whether it's the French colonial wars in Algeria. And of course, there's a materiality to these counterinsurgency campaigns, but what I looked at was the discourse and the narrative around where and in this discourse and this narrative, you could very much see this colonial politics of difference, right? Where um, the state or the colonial state was defined as the legitimate practitioner of violence, was defined as the bastion of of order, while insurgent politics, revolutionary politics, anti-colonial politics was seen as the source of disorder. Of course. In, you know, written into that is a more racialized understanding of the difference between the colonial state and, and the colonized, right? Where it is the barbaric indigenous people that engage in these, um, you know, um, uh, in this politics of disorder and is the white superior civilized um, colonizer that uh, works to um, uh, institute some sort of order. Well, this narrative of this sort of politics of colonial difference then, um, and that was written into um, these counterinsurgency campaigns that um, the colonial administrations um, carried out, of course, became a matter of, you know, generalizable knowledge, right? So if you look at a figure like David Galula, who was an officer in the French colonial army, um, he is now seen as a later day saint of Counterinsurgency, it's counterinsurgency, um, uh, yeah, counterinsurgency theory. Uh, in fact, during the U.S. surge in 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 Iraq, 
uh, General Stanley McChrystal um, supposedly had um, Galula's books on the nightstand to read every night. Um, and what's interesting is that this knowledge um, is decontextualized, right? So this knowledge is seen, it's, there's this understanding that we can somehow extract valuable knowledge while not really recognizing the context in which um, that, that they were formulated. So they become sort of generalizable knowledge, a matter of theory, something that's applicable globally without really understanding or without really recognizing the, in this case, colonial and racialized context in which that they were formulated. So to understand how you know, these counterinsurgency logics work and why is it that we um, um, uh, you know, accord the sacrosanctity to the state, yet we um, are antagonistic to insurgencies and, and revolutionary politics. That's, it's that context that tells us why this, this discourse is being formulated that way. Of course, um, these books, um, these sort of approaches end up in the um, International Relations 101 um, you know, curriculum of these courses. That trains, as if you if you look at say Bob Vitalis's book, um, that trains um, future practitioners, diplomats, and of course that ends up with you know uh, the kinds of policy approaches that you see in the EU um, um, that the EU um, um, carries out um, in in the Palestinian territories, where um, this sort of um, idea that you know state is the um, you know, is st uh, state building is a path to peace building is almost normalized and nationalized, and that's the limit of um, uh, of EU's peace building approaches, right? And that has its colonial roots. The article, of course, ends with um, certain recommendations, if I could call it. One of the things that I talk about is the need to, if peace is indeed the goal, then what what we, what needs to happen is this destigmatization of revolutionary politics, destigmatization of revolutionary violence, destigmatization of insurgent politics. And this thing that we do where we instinctively place insurgents outside the um, realm of normal politics, um, I think that needs to be reversed. And we need to understand that uh, revolutionary politics, insurgent politics does find some sort of legitimacy in the political context in which that they're carried out. Recognizing that, destigmatizing that would then give us access or uh, open the doors for understanding the political project that drives these, um, uh, drives insurgent politics, that drives revolutionary politics. And if only we can um, recognize and, and address the political needs and political wants and the political projects that drive insurgent politics, then, then can we really um, hope for some sort of peace and peace building. Thank you. Sandeep, thank you very much indeed. That's a great presentation. Again, if we're going to remind people to, if they want to put the, pop their questions into the Q&A, that will be great. I'm now delighted to hand over to Nivi. The floor is yours. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and thanks especially to Jasmine and Jenna for putting together such an excellent special issue. And also to Isabella, Isabella and you uh, for organizing it. I, have, I was told I have three minutes because Shari and I have six in total. So I'm gonna talk very briefly about what our paper tries to do and more generally sort of about the questions that have guided us. I was working on borders and Shari on ports in Palestine when we started a conversation about the Israeli border. The primary question we grappled with was how it has come to be that the national border ostensibly fixed in place and indeed a technology of fixity came to be Israel's greatest export. In tracking the shifting and marketable Israeli border and showing the co-constitution of experts and their markets when it comes to this border, we ask how the border reflects a global order that is organized by the twin dictates of racism and capitalism. So in the paper and in the project as a whole, we seek to ask and tentatively to answer one big question. And that is, what can we learn conceptually and empirically about colonialism, race, and capitalism by tracing the relationship between the border and the capitalist corridor. We are especially interested in how racialized processes of border making and bordering are largely considered in national or status terms, but then can be transplanted or transported into other contexts. 
So the two other questions emerge from this. First, who and what enables this movement of the border? And second, what logics and practices are transplanted with the border as it is reproduced, but also seemingly fixed in a new place? We try to show how we cannot speak about these logics without taking into attention the ways in which the regime of racial capitalism underpins the circulations of Israel's border and more broadly underwrites the project of Israeli border security. We look at racial capitalism. The term is coined by Cedric Robinson, but used by us to hint at the core constitution of racism and capitalism, is channeled through physical and conceptual interlocutors and operates concretely through the making and circulations of the border, turning into a, it into a corridor for racial capitalist processes. A lot of this is quite theoretical and Shari will ground this a little in a minute. But as we traverse the imperial archives, we find a constant drive towards categorization, towards distinction and separation in order to both protect the circuits of capitalism and the governing bodies themselves, metropolitan white imperialism, imperialist, uh, as Lisa Lowe, for instance, has written about. So what unfolds in the border's almost mythic ability to stop or block movement is a necessary fix against the violence it produces and also leads to an array of actors that articulate this. But the border itself is actually merely a fiction. And what it depends on is an endless amount of work to hold it in its place and on a fixing of a social order that is constantly in need of such divisions and exploits those divisions. So it's this larger fantasy that is moving with the border and especially with, the Israel, with Israel's commodified border that is made possible by logistic corridors and channels of control and security. So we look at how the Israeli border becomes something commodifiable and franchisable over time. And we talk about how the border becomes the racial fix for capitalist inequality and the corridor becomes its partner as the racial fix for capitalist circuitry. I'll hand it over to Shari to explain some of that. Hi, over to you. Uh, thank you. Well, again, I'm echoing all those thank yous, um, really, Jenna and, and Jasmine and, and Joe and Isabel for everything that you've been doing to kind of help us think through all this work together and, and have turned us into such a collaborative space for thinking. Um, I guess for, you know, where I'm going to take us now is I'm going to try to talk us through sort of the material journey we took with the article with thinking about the border as both an infrastructure of circulation and circulating infrastructure, if you can get your head around that idea. Um, and, and since that was shaping our analysis, we saw we saw the, the interlocutors of, the, of, of these kind of corridors of circulation as key to understanding how Israel's border comes into being as the exemplar of border security and the racializing logics that necessarily operate to produce and legitimate this kind of vision or imaginary of Israel. And so for us, that meant following the border's genealogy, how it becomes this kind of fixed site, but also an exportable and a circulating product through three kind of moments in its history, in the making of its history. Like, so first we start with the 1937 Peel Commission and kind of the introduction of partition to this site. We then looked at the post-1948 making of Israel's what's called defensible border or security frontier ideas. And then Israel's post-9-11 kind of promulgation and, and kind of um, and leadership in the global border security industry. And to us, all those three moments generate and are generated by as well as help to normalize the racial capitalist global order that Nibi was just actually talking about. Um, so we started by following the border through its journey to Palestine via British colonial officers and administrators born kind of in this moment in British empire making when they were trying to figure out how to lessen you know, the empire's direct administrative entanglements with its colonies at a time when colonized peoples were making their governance really increasingly untenable. Um, and the starting point was triggered by our interest in the knowledge accumulating and traveling through the circulation of the idea of partition across empire, where Palestine basically becomes a test case uh, for how to do the two things borders and quarters basically need to do. On one hand, contain unruly populations, while at the same time enabling like these clear channels for the movement of British goods and security. The partition in Palestine exemplified the material underpinning for how fixes to racial capitalist antinomies would and could work. And, a, and this is a pattern that we kind of see repeating across these other moments in different ways. 
and, and is really deeply embedded in the making of Israel's kind of border brand that Nibi was talking about. So the second moment that we looked at was, you know, basically traces two logics in the making of Israeli borders in the af aftermath of 1948, 1949. You know, on the one hand is an elastic, flexible frontier that's constantly moving and capable of change and conquest, uh, which is how it sees itself in any case. And at the same time, seeing itself as having this kind of fixed, secure fortress that helped produce a particular fiction of Israel as a scrappy and kind of alienated island surrounded by violence and impending destruction. You know, this image that's also reinforced by colonial and racial understandings of the region. And it's these two logs, the logics that we saw make their way into Israel's kind of border technologies and very much its security brand, its ability to move as well as its ability to contain. And, and, and you know, this is kind of building and dependent on over 70 years of building these defensible borders against what's considered unwanted surplus po populations that have tried but seemingly failed to infiltrate its space. This is literally the brand that's born into the border. And then we kind of shift into this kind of third moment um, in the present where we're focusing on Magal, a global conglomerate in the border security industry that's built its reputation on, on the fact that it has been behind at least 80% of, um, of Israel's border technologies. And through Magal, we can kind of trace this evolving supply chain that links high tech, battle te allegedly battle tested or field tested materials, as, as they call them, you know, as well as the expert practitioners that, that, that design and make this brand ubiquitous, you know, both in, you know, in both public and private practices, let's say of video surveillance, and those that market, sell, covet, and really buy these products. You know, Magal as a company is really deeply disturbing as it's linked. Israel's defense forces and most famous weapons makers like Elbit and Rafael, uh, and that among its successes, it counts the design of Israel's seam zone and population management systems and border regimes in the West Bank, alongside like the high tech fences and walls along the Egyptian or Gaza borders. But what's especially disturbing is the fact that this is also what sells Magal to the global market, and which is seeking to reinforce and replicate this kind of success. Um, and so throughout the article, as you said, is, and that I'm hoping that I made clear as well, that we're seeking to understand the way borders are made and moved through these, these interlocutors that cultivate the fiction of the border as, a necess as necessary for the fixing of the kinds of violence and unruliness that the border, in fact, also creates. And I'm going to just end with this idea that we also end with in the article, which is like we're trying, we tried to end with a moment of refusal in which Palestinian refugees kind of walked en masse across Israel's border. Uh, with Syria on the 15th of May as part of a march of return. And through that act, reveal the fiction of the impenetrability of this you know, Israeli state fortress through a collective act of return. And in doing so, they kind of create this possibility of imagining a very different way of connecting different movements, um, which were kind of also initially the creation of the border in the first place was about containing those movements. And those movements kind of clearly are uncontainable if they're collectively practiced. And that's where I'm gonna end. Thank you very much. Well, now we're going on to the uh, Q&A part of the, the whole session. So please put your questions into, into the Q&A box and I'll, I'll read them out. Um, if I start off with, uh, Prem Singh Gil has come up with a question. Given that the ongoing crisis in Russia, Ukraine, the invasion is possibly similar from what it can be contrasted with what American, America did to Afghanistan. What do you see in common between big states in cross, contrast to weak states or vice versa with the scenario of Russia, Ukraine? I'm not sure who'd like to kick off with that one. Any volunteers? Um, I'm sure others have also got views on it. Um, no, thank you for the question. Um, very briefly, I think I can identify uh, contrasts. Um, in that here we have an invasion by uh, a great power against a weak state, uh, uh, sort of not as weak or considered a fragile state as Afghanistan, but a weaker state um, from Russia, as in Russia's invasion to Ukraine. And historically we had an invasion from a great power, um, the United States against a weak state, Afghanistan. And yet, and this ties in very much with Son's um, paper, is the, validity and the legitimacy of Ukrainian armed armed resistance against the Russian invasion is not being questioned or in doubt at all. 
if anything, it's been supported and celebrated. I've seen it all across my social media, even people that don't usually comment um, on geopolitical matters. Whereas in contrast, Afghani resistance uh, to the US invasion was outlawed and really ties in with the arguments that Son's making and seen as in fact classified as terrorism. Um, and if we look at the other way around at the treatment of the great powers, um, there's actually an acceptance of the need to sanction and even boycott uh, Russia. Um, whereas I don't remember anybody suggesting that the United States should be sanctioned or boycotted for invading Afghanistan. And actually we look forward to what happened when they invaded Iraq and because France actually expressed some doubt about US invasion of Iraq, there was a boycott of French goods and changing French fries to freedom fries and other nonsensical things like that. So um, there's a real real contrast in how the two great powers have been treated, but also the locals and their rights to resist. Thank you. Anybody else would like to come in on this one? So okay, we've got plenty of other questions. So that's, I also want to keep keep it going. So next question is um, to Sandeep. How much would you how much would you see a similar pattern in what is currently developing the Sahar? Would you include radical armed movements in that region as in Vaticanus insurgents? Um, it's hard it's hard for me to say because I'm not an expert on the Sahel, but to but but my article was less about what a group whether a group is or is not an insurgent group it was more about the colonial roots of the counterinsurgency campaign and how that shapes uh policy priorities and so on and so forth but yeah that's great i found it it's interesting to see how much western and so forth groups are engaging uh Next question. Uh, picking up on the notion of the colonial toolbox, how can we begin to move past it in policymaking circles, where these tools have served them what, uh, served us so well so, for so far so long? How can we move past these colonial these toolbox? Because I think you've all identified one of the challenges for policymakers is they're looking for structures, they're looking for historical precedents, they're looking for ideas that they can they can reach to to take. Decisions. So, how do they how do they go forward from here? I, mean, I can um, maybe start off with just a few quick comments. There, I think um, I don't know that it served you so well, right? So, like, if we look at uh, what has happened in Afghanistan, like that's that's not a good situation. Right? So, it serves you so well if your goals are you know, to continue to occupy and destroy lands and, um, you know, inflict a lot of violence on people and then invisibilize their their struggles. Like, so it depends on what your goals are, right? So if those are not the goals, then perhaps you need to think about other ways of doing things. And I think, um, you know, I said this just last week in a, in a conference, like Afghanistan, that has to be, it has to be something that makes the international community or international policy actors stop and think you, you have to do something differently, right? Like, you know, in, um, after the, uh, the Cold War after 9-11, the response of the UN was to extend and further intervention to have a deeper footprint after massive failures in Rwanda, Bosnia, um, and um, Somalia. Maybe we do something different this time, right? So like large interventions, large um, in occupations, it does not lead to anything sustainable. It just leads to more violence. And so we have to rethink what intervention looks like. I think there's a lot of research um, on that. I think there's a lot of um, cues that you can take from civil society networks and groups in different um, locations and countries. Like I think, I think there are a lot of people who've been thinking about how to do things differently for a very long time. What you can do is listen and engage with those groups. And I think if that happens and there's a little bit more honesty uh, in the conversation, then actually, yeah, we could probably move forward in a lot of very different ways and it wouldn't take that much, but you, I mean, what policymakers need to do is let go of those frameworks and engage with your politicians. Yeah, I think um, yeah, I've just asked the same question, Althea, has, has this actually worked for you? Um, but I think that um, in terms of the toolbox, I think what we're also seeing is a lack of imagination, right? In terms of um, <clears throat> what kind of uh, 
policy making works. And I think that has to do with um, some of the things that Althea was saying, but also has to do with um, education in terms of the pedagogical approaches that we take in the classroom, that how we train these um, you know, future diplomats, future policy makers. It has, it has to do with the curricular approaches, the pedagogical approaches, and you see this um, you know, at the bachelor level, master level, where how they imagine the world is already being solidified there. And <clears throat> things that you know, um, we will think that don't work. Uh, you know, it's already sort of commonplace, um, you know, and normalized in the mindset of, of, of many of these future policymakers. Like one of the things I used to do as a, you know, as a PhD student when I was teaching is, um, you know, we would go through different words. I used to teach this course on political Islam, and we would just look at the history and the politics of the word, you know, terrorism and how it's been deployed and what's the, something that is so commonplace uh, when, we, when we talk about political Islam, what is the different politics and how it's been deployed and unpack that and what that means for you know, um, how we approach, um, approach politics. So I think a lot of work needs to be done in, in, in the classroom as well. That's great. Anybody else want to come in? Otherwise, move up to the next question. I've got one for Jasmine um, from Amar Hamza. How can we challenge and maybe end this Orientalist views from the West towards the Middle East? How do we how do we get the West to move on from this? Thank you. Thanks, Amal. That's a really good question. Um, I think I'm going to fold my answer into what I was going to say in response to the other question, the one on the Mariana's question, the colonial toolbox. Um, it, it, it builds on what others have said, um, but for policy makers, and if we're talking about challenging Orientalism in policy, then they need to expand their capacity to listen to the decades of critique of those Orientalist policies. Um, and that critique has come from scholars in the West, and it's come from a critique of scholars living in, in the regions in, in so-called Muslim uh, dominated parts of the world. Um, now that ability to listen and to take it seriously, um, and this is tying into like, how can we dismantle the colonial toolbox, means policymakers need to not be averse to uh, commentary that is critical that criticizes their policies. And what we tend to sometimes see is that policymakers do listen. They do listen to experts, they do listen to academics, they are engaging with think tanks, but often it will be with the type of expertise that is validating their policies or offering a more efficient way of carrying out existing policies rather than problematizing the foundations of those policies altogether. Right, and so that just from a place of empirical rigor and efficiency is to acknowledge and accept the, the foundational criticism rather than looking at the expertise that is seeking to make an impact simply by fine tuning or, or uh, polishing the policies that already exist. And that's a trend that we seem to, to see at the moment. That's great, thank you very much. Of course, we've got quite a lot of questions coming in. Um, for Nivin Sharia, um, can a border be malleable and changed based on history and political relations? Um, thank you for the question, Alina. Um, I think the whole point of our article is to think about the border as a fixed site being a fiction, but also being a material thing. And it is that material thing that is being transplanted and transferable, but through like these, in, but actually through practitioners, interlocutors, buyers, marketers, um, security technicians, um, and even people who work like in financial markets to kind of sell this as a financial um, speculative thing. I think that is actually your, your question about malleability. The border is both always um, clearly malleable, but also has really powerful material fixed existences as well and so it is yeah so you always need to be thinking about those things at once yeah and just to say uh and this might be obvious but the border is not experienced 
the same by everyone, right? So the border might be a very fixed thing when you're a refugee trying to cross it. Uh, but if you're, you know, capital or a rich person with a certain type of passport, you'll experience it very differently. So the border moves um, in, in different ways, depending on who you are uh, as you move or aren't moved through it. So you might experience it as a site of fixity or as a site that is basically open. Uh, but yeah, that's what we tried to say that the, the whole notion that the border is just simply fixed um, is mythical. Thank you. Uh, that's brilliant. Uh, next question. Would there ever be an equity of power for the colonized? Can the UN ensure policymaking that could dismiss ethnocentric perspectives? I mean, I can give a short answer in relation to the UN. Um, it is structured to not offer equity of power for the colonized. We have um, permanent members of the Security Council is designed to ensure who have a veto um, over policy. Um, so it's designed actually to ensure that former colonizers, current hegemons can't, um, can't be displaced from that position and can't feel um, the consequences um, globally of, of the actions that they take. I would also say just acknowledgement that the UN General Assembly is a really interesting site where even though it's none of the, the votes are binding, it is an interesting site of, of reflecting discourse where often those who have been disempowered historically will make their voice heard and known, which is often an interesting counter discourse to the UN Security Council. Thank you very much indeed. I'm conscious we've got a few minutes left. We've got a question from Professor uh, Justina Dillon in Canada. What would you say about challenging the notion of border in the sense that the border we are, that the border is created and so movement across the border should be free? Um, in theory, I would just say that yes, absolutely, that um, movement across borders should be free, but I don't think that that necessarily does away with the other larger structures we're talking about, so structures of racial capitalism that will persist in spite of borders, whether borders are open or not, some people will, uh, will bear the brunt of uh, living uh, in poverty, being racialized, etc. I don't think, I think the, the, uh, the opening up of borders is not a sufficient condition for the restructuring of current colonized and colonial relations. And that's my short answer, Shari, I don't know if you want to jump in. Uh, Althea also seems to have, I, I was actually like, I was actually going to say before, I was like, I feel like this is such a good question for Nivi because she, she's actually thinking about this idea a lot in, in her work. And I almost want to kind of tag on the idea and that something that I learned from her, but also learned from looking at Palestinian movements, let's say inside Israel, that not, I think that um, there, are, there are different ways of thinking about um, border abolition and, and border imperialism and border sovereignties and you know because if we think about indigenous politics indigenous groups thinking about new ways of ordering space and the loss of a border also being a way of erasing indigenous rights to sovereignty and land and so on it's not as it's, it's almost like we're asking I think we're asking in a way different questions one would be about like the national borders of you know of states that were made through colonial processes versus different communities and groups that are fighting for rec like for their their own um ways of living and being and 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 having place so i think that i think we just need to be thinking in more hybrid or malleable ways around borders in the first place and and that Nivi's point about racial capitalism is a really good one it's not sufficient to only think of it in those terms Okay, thank you. We've got one last question for us. Some running out of time. Oh, so Althea, I, I was curious, but Althea was going to say. Althea, you go. No, you get coming up. Althea. No, that's okay. I was actually going to go back to the question on policy, but let's just move forward. Some deeper. That's fine. You sure? You sure? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. One last question, Some Do you think we can ever reframe insurgent as something else, or will the quest for agency and legitimacy, legitimacy perpetuate the ongoing power dynamics? Um, 
Yeah, so I mean, there's a problem in my article, right? So I, I, I um, refer to these sorts of groups of factions or movements as insurgencies, but that's only because I'm talking about counterinsurgencies and how they frame certain kinds of political projects or political <clears throat> activists. But I think that the way the article ends where I <clears throat> recommend a different understanding of, you know, who insurgents are and what they do and what they aspire for in and of itself is a way of reframing insurgents as something else. And what Althea was saying is that, you know, we need to ask different kinds of questions, but we should also ask different kinds of questions to different kinds of people and ask them and, and try to get a sense of what is what is the, what are their political aspirations and imaginations and understandings of the future. We need to read different kinds of texts that um, understand politics from a different perspective, completely rethink, you know, um, the roots of international relations. I mean, from Fernand to Merce Tate, who, um, you know, provide a completely different understanding of what the global order is, who it works for, and who it doesn't work for. And once we introduce these different readings of politics and different readings of international relations, can we really even consider, you know, or um, expect some sort of reframing of, of, of insurgency or something. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to have a word. Time is beating us. Um, just forced me to say thanks very much to my colleague Izzy, who who's behind the scenes has put the whole thing together. And um, I, I thank her for all that she's done, her hard work on this. To thank all the participants for their great papers and to emphasize that they reminded that the whole special edition of International Affairs is online, on, especially if you're on race and imperialism, online at the moment for free. You can download it, but do so before the end of March when the time limit runs out. So get onto our website, look at these papers of either the respective authors here and also the other authors. To thank all the authors for their participation, it's been great to hear their, their views, and I'm sure you benefited from that. And also thank you all the part all those who've joined us, all the participants. It's been really great to uh, to have you on board. And with that, I say thank you very much indeed, and wish you all a good evening, good morning, or wherever, whatever time zone you happen to be in. Goodbye.